Amen. Good morning, family. Wow. Happy, happy Resurrection Sunday. It's great to be together. We first have to give a huge round of applause to our incredible team who did that performance, led by Will Koraluk, right over here. Just, I, I don't know about you, but that, that was so inspiring and raw, genuine. I mean, it was just incredible. Thank you so much, Will. That, that was all created from the mind of Will Koraluk. Working in tandem with Liz Famarewa and Eden and Ilya and uh, Charles. And I don't know about you, but, you know, we had to pick Charles to be Jesus. Like, w when we look around the church and we see, hey, who's got the, like, the coolest accent? You know, and, and Charles just, you know, the way he says certain words, it's just so, so tender, so soft, you know? I mean, it's just beautiful. Yeah. Got some contenders over here who wanted to play Jesus. <laughs> but thank you, thank you all. Thank you all for, for giving your hearts and being so raw and genuine with us in that performance. And then obviously want to give a round of applause for Valentina Lobo. Which, uh, I'm pretty sure her name is Valentina Lobo. Not Lobo. It's like, it's like slightly different, but I'm just like, Lobo. Lobo. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> well, again, just happy Easter Sunday. If you don't know, my name is Kirk Hamula. I am your friendly neighborhood bearded man. And uh, I have the incredible honor alongside my wife, Margie, to lead the mighty York region. And uh, I'm excited to study out the scriptures with you this morning. So if you don't have a Bible, share with the person next to you. Grab it right now and open to Luke chapter 24. We didn't come to church just to sing incredible songs, see an amazing performance, be able to hear different people speak. But we came to hear the word of God this morning. And on a day like today, that it is Easter Sunday, we understand it to be the theme. If you don't preach about the resurrection, you might as well get fired as a preacher, right, on Easter Sunday. And so I won't be doing that. I'm not going to be giving the temptation to Evan to fire me. And so the, what we're going to be looking at is, what did the resurrection of Jesus actually do? You know, for us as guys in the room, a lot of us go to the gym. And uh, if you... If you don't go to the gym, consider this a challenge and rebuke from the altar. But you go to the gym, and, you know, a lot of us guys, we want to know how far we're, we've come. We want to know what weights we're able to do, what, what PRs, personal records, we're able to break. Are you with me? And so in a similar way, I wanted to see, what, biblically, what did Jesus do through the resurrection? The ultimate deadlift. You see what I did there? And so we understand Jesus did incredible things. We understand that he led a ministry of three and a half years, gathering disciples. He healed thousands. He taught thousands. And for all the guys in the room, we get fired up because he fed thousands as well. Lots of bread, lots of fish. But he did all that, and it culminated into the Pharisees and the religious elite uh, being threatened by him to the point that they were able to convince the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, to crucify him in their efforts to keep the peace under the Roman oppression. I didn't lose you there, did I? And so we understand all that culminated into three days after he, cru he was crucified. We read these words in Luke 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, that is Sunday, very early in the morning, amen, campus students, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men clothed in clothes that gleamed like lightning, most likely KP and Kyle are South African. You know, if you don't know, 
Kyle and KP are from South Africa. They go thrift shopping every single, you know, couple two weeks or three weeks, and they always look like they're gleaming in lightning. But we, we understand biblically these were two angels stood beside them in verse 5. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the, over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. You know, what an amazing display that we get to celebrate that God raised Jesus from the dead after three days. You know, we understand uh, this incredible question that the women are asked, why are you looking for the living among the dead? These people just went through this this unbelievably atrocious execution of their, their rabbi, and they are in mourning still, looking to prepare Jesus' body, and then the, the angels say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And it's amazing because they obviously forgot that Jesus spoke many a time about how he was going to resurrect from the dead, that he was going to perform the ultimate deadlift in raising from the dead itself. And, you know, Jesus' resurrection is such a display of God's power, isn't it? You know, we can look into just even our own lives, how you and I are created. It shows God's power. Your face, my face, everything about us. I mean, we look at nature even. I mean, most of us, I'm sure, have been to Niagara Falls. It's hard not to go to Niagara Falls and just be taken back by the beauty and the power of those falls. Are you with me? And all that, even just to say, even in the Old Testament, God showed his power. And one of my personal favorites is when God parts the Red Sea, where there's a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left. One of my favorite movies growing up was The Prince of Egypt. And... I love the way they put it because, you know, there's a, there's a lightning strike and then, the, you know, the light comes in and then it shows a whale swimming right along the wall of the water, which as I got older, I'm like, is there whales in the Red Sea? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It looks so cool. It looks so epic. But to me, it just is such an incredible display of power. And so I've entitled the lesson today, The Power of the Resurrection. And I hope today that we can walk away not just having the knowledge of the resurrection, but having the power of the resurrection in our lives as we go out and live as disciples. Point number one, he broke the power of death. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 2. The first thing Jesus did in being buried and being uh, being risen from the dead (laughs) is that he broke the power of death itself. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Give me an amen when you guys get there. We don't believe in not participating during the sermon. And so give me an amen when you get there. All right, we got some some fast Bible flippers over here. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't be a a pastor, a, a preacher preaching unless there's some dad jokes in there. So, you know, if you're wondering what Jesus got at Starbucks in the first century... You need not fear any longer. He didn't go to Starbucks. He brewed his own coffee. I know some of you guys already heard that. I know. I know. I'm trying to get new material, okay? Bear with me. Bear with me. I am the father of three kids, so I get to do dad jokes as much as I want. Well, here in Hebrews 2, verse 14, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. You know, it's amazing that we have a merciful and faithful high priest in Jesus who can relate with us through all the ups and downs of life. And I can't help but think of just even the performance we just saw where Liz and Will shared vulnerably about even perhaps some of the experiences that we go through. And to be able to know that God is able to 
relate to us through what Jesus experienced on earth, being fully human and fully God. And just as he was tempted in every way, he did not give in once, giving us, obviously, the hope that we can overcome in any and every situation. But I want to bring your attention to verse 14, which says that in his death, he would break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. That's interesting. I've been thinking about this all week. What does that mean? Now, I'm sure some of us are familiar with the concept of the Grim Reaper, right? The angel of darkness that has a huge sickle and, and is going to call people home uh, or call people to you know, condemnation, either one. And it's interesting because oftentimes it's, it's portrayed in such an evil context, right? That it, it is part of Satan's plan, not part of God's plan. But in actuality, biblically speaking, God is the one who calls us home. He's the, he's the one who knows our last day, truly our last day. But yet, it says here that the devil has the power over death. Well, what does that mean? And as I thought more and more about it, I reflected back to the very, very beginning of our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve. If you recall, in the garden, God created Adam and Eve, and he said that you can eat from any and every tree in the garden, except one. Not two, one. The knowledge of the tree of good, or the, the tree of the knowledge, <laughs> tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What oftentimes people confuse, though, is that there was the tree of life in the garden of Eden. Meaning that in God's original blueprint, when he created mankind, they had eternal life. Who was the one who introduced us to death? The serpent, Satan himself. And so in that sense, he had the power of death to lure us out of the garden and has provided us with well, the current situation that we have right now, which I'm sure all of us who are a little older, you know, we understand that we're going to be dying pretty soon, right? And we understand that this is a little scary, Right? I, I don't mean to, to scare you, but, you know, we're talking about death and resurrection. You're going to die one day. And it's up to you to figure out where you're going to be headed. But for us, Jesus provides us with this, this incredible reality that he broke the power of death. That we need not fear death any longer. We can, t we can speak openly about death. I don't mind telling you you're going to die. I know some of you guys were like, whoa. whoa. Why is he talking like that? Because any day could be our last. Any day could be our last. Today could be the last church service you go to. I don't know. The question becomes, are you confident in having a powerful, resurrected life with God? I am. I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't feel the safest with the Toronto drivers on the road. Anybody relate with me a little bit? It's a little dicey out there. So I don't know about you, but every time I get in a car, I'm like, I better make sure that I'm really right with God here <laughs> because I, I, I want to die and go and be with God. And so, you know, back to, to what Jesus did in resurrecting from the dead, he broke the power that Satan had over death. And, you know, for me, one of my favorite scenes from um, a movie that we all know, The Passion of Christ, uh, now almost 20 years ago that it came out, it's still remarkable to think about but one of the scenes that they took a little bit of a creative license with in, in depicting was when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we all know the very famous words, not your will, but not, not on my will, but your will. And as he's praying in the garden, it shows Satan in the corner there, you know, kind of sinisterly, sinisterly looking at him. And as he's looking at Jesus, a, a snake, a real snake, which I, I hate snakes. It's like a very disturbing scene for me to watch. The snake slithers out from the cloak of Satan and starts making its way towards Jesus. And as Jesus is on the ground, on his knees praying, the snake is going all over his arms and trying to coil him up, trying to tempt him away from doing God's will. And it shows in uh, The Passion of the Christ, this is one of the very first scenes, Jesus stands up, looks directly at Satan as the snake is right there underneath his foot. doesn't fire you up I don't know what will I mean that fires me up because that is what Jesus did as he went to his crucifixion and died for us died for humanity he broke the power that Satan had over us turn over to Colossians chapter 2 we see it written in different words 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. We don't believe in going to just one passage in our church. We go to many passages during the sermon. So I hope that you know where Colossians is. It is a Bible study. Colossians 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers, a.k.a. broke the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I love this passage, particularly because the word triumph is in there. And if you don't know, I'm a motorcycle rider, and my, the, the, the brand of my motorcycle is triumph. So I love any scripture that has the word triumph in it. But, you know, Jesus here is described as triumphing over the dark powers and authorities over them by the cross. You know, and I love it because he says here he made a public spectacle of him, of them. You know, for those 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead and spent those 40 days with the apostles and the, the faithful 120, I just have to believe that, God, that, that Jesus was just having that championship level vibe where, where he, just, he just won the chip. For all of us guys, we know, you know, we have our, our favorite sports. We have, you know, football, you know, and I'm talking about real football, the one that you kick, right? You know, actual football. Then, then there's American football. But, you know, there's, there's basketball. We all have our favorite sports, right? And, uh, you know, it's always funny to see people and teams celebrating the championship, right? Uh, one in particular that always comes to my mind, because I'm a Lakers fan, I'm from Los Angeles, and so I'm a Lakers fan, and I grew up during the Kobe and Shaq era, and so, you know, it was always uh, the Lakers versus the Celtics, that was the big rivalry, right? And uh, there was one season where the Celtics beat us, and uh, Kevin Garnett and the, the Celtics team of that year won the championship. <laughs> and I remember uh, they were interviewing him, and they're like, how do you feel, Kevin? And then he's just got a hat, you know, says championship. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. Anything is possible! I mean, it was like so funny, you know? Yeah, you make a public spectacle of it when you win the championship. And I don't know if Jesus had the exact same, you know, you know, anything is possible, you know, like Kevin Garnett. But that is the victory that you and I get to celebrate today. I, I hope that you feel that celebration today. That Easter Sunday is not just the, the guilt-ridden Sunday that you have to go to church, as many people do, but that you truly celebrate what happened on that cross. You celebrate the empty tomb that Jesus rose from. You know, back to this scripture, it's so encouraging to know that God forgives us of all of our sins. Verse 14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. You know, for me, the list was pretty long. It was a long list. It was one of those scrolls where you, you start here and it just rolls down and rolls down all the way to the back of the room. You know, similar to Isaiah Famarebas, probably. Yeah, yeah, Isaiah's probably went all the way to TMU, right? But how incredible is it that however long that list is, however, however many things we've done where we fail, that Jesus took that list and nailed it to the cross. And through understanding how we were dead in our sins and how we are made alive with Christ, we can enjoy the power of Jesus' resurrection in our lives. You may be wondering, well, how can you enjoy this being made alive with Christ? Well, verse 11, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. How can you have this celebration, this assurance that you have been broken free from the power of death? You've been baptized into Christ. That is the moment that you are forgiven and that your legal indebtedness is washed away. And you can live free knowing it doesn't matter if I get into a car accident today doesn't matter. I'm, I'm going to go be and in, in, in be home with my creator. 
I can't help but think of our incredible brother who was just recently baptized three weeks ago, Alvin Kasutu. Because, you know, Alvin, if you, if you, don't, if you haven't met him, he's very mild-mannered. He's actually looking really sharp today. He's wearing like a tuxedo over there. I, I don't know if it's actually a tuxedo, but he's looking pretty sharp over there. He, he's got a resurrected life over there. But, you know, it's encouraging. Alvin was met by our incredible brother, Will Korluk, at 10... 10 p.m. at night on a Wednesday in January, and he started coming to church and started, you know, being a part of, uh, of the fellowship and studying the Bible, but things hadn't really gotten serious for him until we sat down, Will and I and him, and it was on, I believe, a Thursday, and we, we sat down, and we said, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm good. I um, had a heart attack earlier this week. Uh, c- come again? And Will and I are just like, okay, he's joking, right? No, I had a heart attack. Are you okay? <laughs> We're like freaked out. We're like, what do you mean? And he explains how earlier that week, he felt some tightness in his chest. Started feeling this like unbelievable pain. He gets in his car and drives to his boss's, uh, to his workplace where his boss was and says, hey boss, I'm having some, some tightness in my chest, some pain, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that. Getting advice about how to have a heart attack essentially. <laughs> His boss tells him, I think you're having a heart attack. (laughs) He gets back in his car and drives to the hospital. (laughs) We're listening to this. We're like, you did what? (laughs) He goes to the hospital. The the doctors, you know, perform some tests, and they they tell him, you you just had a heart attack. (laughs) 19 years old. Now, we're sitting down with him after the fact, and he's now going to, you know, routine medical appointments every day or every other day to figure out what's going on. As this is happening, he's now fully committed himself to getting baptized and becoming a disciple of Christ. And I can't help but think that it's, it has to do, obviously, with his near-death encounter. Death is just literally looking at him right there in a heart attack. Now, as he's studying the Bible, as, uh, you know, we're, we're getting together with him every day, he's going to the hospital every other day. We get together on Friday. He tells us that on Friday, he has to go in to have a doctor's ap- <clears throat> appointment. The doctor and the nurses say, hey, we need to put a heart monitor on you for 48 hours to gauge and track uh, your, your heart rhythms to make sure you know, we, we tick all the boxes. We figure out what's going on with you. Alan says, that's great, but I, I have to get baptized on Sunday. They say, no, no, that can't, that's not possible. Uh, the, the heart monitor has to stay on you, and you cannot get wet. You cannot take a shower. You cannot get baptized. I'm, so, I, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. I have to get baptized. Now, the doctors, I'm sure, said something to the effect of, well, Alvin, what, think about your life. Alvin says, yeah, I am. I'm thinking about my life to come, the next life. And, and through the conversation, Alvin convinces the doctor and nurses to meet him on 8 a.m. on Sunday to get the heart monitor off so that he could then get baptized later that day, which was three weeks ago, March 10th. And now Alvin can, can have that blessed assurance, that celebration of the power of the resurrection. Jesus broke the power of death. Point number two, he broke the power of fear. Turn back over to Hebrews chapter two. You guys still with me? You guys haven't fallen asleep, have you? You're not in the tomb, are you? Okay, all right, I just want to make sure. Just want to make sure. Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 15, we already read this in our, our previous reading, but it says that fear truly can be something else that we have, we allow power over us in our lives. You know, Jesus here in uh, verse 18 is described as suffering when he was tempted, and he's able to help those who are being tempted and suffering as well. And, you know, Jesus was able to go through all of the suffering of the crucifixion, all that suffering in order for us to be brought to him. Look what it says here in Hebrews 2, verse 10. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory. Now, isn't that so encouraging how Charles was addressed, or not Charles, Jesus. (laughs) Jesus was talking to Liz and to Will son and daughter. We're not just strangers to God. We are sons and daughters. For those of us who haven't been baptized, we're lost sons and daughters who will become redeemed sons and daughters. 
Verse 10, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their faith, of their salvation, perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Jesus suffered in order for us to become a part of God's family. That fires me up. That, that, that just fills me up. This room is my family. I mean, shoot, I live, I, I've moved across the continent to be a part of this family. I love you all so much. It, it, it's, a, it's a joy to be a part of God's family, isn't it? You know, when we come together and the blood of Christ brings us together, we set aside our, our past. We set aside our sin. We set aside all of what used to define us. And we go to the scriptures and are defined by a relationship with God, walking with Jesus. And therefore, we have everything in common. You know, this last week, we were able to celebrate uh, Will Korolek's 30th birthday. And uh, I know you may be surprised he's 30. He's 30 years young. You know, Will's one of those guys that he doesn't even look 30. He looks, you know, younger. He looks like 27 or 26, you know. And Whereas I'm 31, I look 36, you know, <laughs> in the other direction. But, um, you know, we were able to celebrate um, Will's birthday with uh, some hamburgers. And then afterwards, we, we got together and we all shared from our heart what Will means to us. And uh, obviously, it's very encouraging to have his mom in town from Calgary as well. Uh, she surprised him on campus on Thursday, uh, which was the day of his birthday. And uh, later that night, we got to have this get together and uh, just, just have some time of sharing about Will. And just as I was looking around, I'm like, wow, we're so different. <laughs> I look at Alvin from Uganda. <laughs> I'm looking over at Emmy from Nigeria slash Ivory Coast. Yeah, a little bit of both. I, I then look over at Christian growing up in Kenya. I, I look over at Josh growing up in Alberta. I look at Rich growing up in Manitoba. Did I get it right? Saskatchewan, sorry. Sorry. I don't know why, but I feel like when you say Saskatchewan, it feels like you're offending me. Yeah. Like, you're a Saskatchewan, you know. But uh, sorry, we're Rich being from Saskatchewan. But we're all from you know, different places, different walks of life, different upbringings. And yet we, we're brought together to become a part of God's family. And, and truly, this is the church that you come to today, a family. We're not interested with just you sitting in the pews and then leaving. We, we actually want to get to know you. We actually want to know what was your favorite TV show when you were a kid. We want to know all of the intricate details of your life because that, that's what family is. Family is where we truly know one another. And, you know, it's been so amazing just even this, this year, calendar year. In the first three months, we've seen 21 souls baptized into Christ. We are a growing family because we continue to be family. It's up to those that now are baptized to, again, take on that mantle of becoming family. We've all been there where we, we, we become family and then someone hurts us. It's, oh, there's a wall now. And the power of the resurrection comes into your life. It breaks that power of fear so that you continue to give your heart even when your feelings get hurt. Amen? That's what it looks like to live a life that has been broken by, that has been broken free from fear. Let's go over quickly to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. A scripture that we know very well. Then, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. We know this scripture very well. One of our foundational scriptures on what a disciple is. And what I want to highlight is that Jesus tells us to be a disciple, you must embrace pain. You can no longer have fear of pain. You must embrace it as it comes your way. And, you know, I found it funny that God gave me a physical illustration for pain this week. As uh, Wednesday, I went to my CrossFit box. I do CrossFit, which is a combination of weightlifting and uh, metabolic conditioning and gymnastics and everything. So it, it kind of calls you... It calls you out of your comfort zone every time. And one of the moves that we do there is called double unders. 
And if you don't know what a double under is, you have a jump rope, and a single under is where you go like this, right? Right, we all know how to do that. A double under is where it's a very fast rope, so you go two times underneath your legs. You have to, you have to do a very quick, very quick. And you have to learn the technique. You gotta learn the rhythm. You have to learn how, how to do it. And, and I'm right now at a point where I can do about five or 10 in a row, and I'm trying to like get better and better and get more and more reps. Now, part of learning double unders is when you mess up, you have to embrace the pain. Because when a jump rope hits your legs, it feels exactly, I'm sure, how Jesus felt when he was flogged. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't show you now because it's thankfully healed up uh, in the last few days. But on Wednesday, all Wednesday, Thursday, my leg was like bloodied up from the double unders. A little bit of blood. Not a lot of blood. <laughs> not as much blood as Jesus, obviously. All right? I'm not trying to make a parallel there. <laughs> but my point being is that we have to embrace the pain. And that's what I love about CrossFit is that you just have to show up and you just, you're with the other people in the class. You're like, you ready? No, let's do it. Yeah. And you just have to embrace the pain of the class. You know, if that wasn't enough, God uh, continued to give me more illustrations because when we went to go celebrate Will's birthday, we went to an obstacle course and I jammed my finger. And if you look at it, it's discolored right now. There's like a little bit of a bruise right there. And so this has been throbbing Thursday night into Friday. And then on top of that, because I couldn't sleep well, I got a kink in my neck. You guys ever had like a muscle strain in your neck? You don't sleep right? So third, uh, Friday, Saturday, I'm walking around. My legs are hurting. I'm holding my finger. And then when people wanted to talk to me, I had to turn like this. <laughs> Just in pain. <laughs> like, all right, thanks, God. <laughs> all right, you knew I was preaching this Sunday, so you wanted to give me a really good illustration on pain. <laughs> But I think for all of us, we have to embrace that living the life of a disciple is going to be painful at times. It's not always going to feel nice and cupcakes and rainbows being righteous. That's a great misconception of our day in the religious world. To be righteous, it should always feel good. Should, things will always work out. Except, correct me if I'm wrong, but every prophet in the Old Testament was like killed, weren't they? It didn't really turn out the greatest for them, did it? Now, th there's moments that are obviously good, granted, but there's going to be moments that are tough. And without the understanding that there's going to be a mixture, you're going to be let down by the fact that pain is still coming your way as a disciple. And you've got to ask yourself, are you willing to embrace that pain in your life? <laughs> Romans 8.28 says that God works for the good of those who love him. That is in everything. In every hardship that you and I go through, God can give us good things. And through that, we can break free from the fear of what's going to happen in this situation. What's going to happen if this person does this? Or what if that happens? Or what if this happens? We live by fear rather than by faith. And you cannot make it to heaven without faith. So the challenge for us in living, in having that power of the resurrection is to break free from the power of fear. Our third and final point, he broke the power of sin. Turn over to Romans chapter 6. <laughs> Getting Spanish over here. Romans 6 verse 11. Not only did Jesus break the power of death, the power of fear, but he also broke the power of sin for us. In verse 11, it says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Isn't that not awesome? We are set free in becoming disciples from the power of sin. I mean, how incredible is that, family? That we get to, we get to be a part of, of walking with Jesus, having known that the, 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 the yoke that was upon our shoulders that was too heavy to bear, we all were in, the, in that darkness, 
where we wanted to change. We didn't want to keep going to those sins. We didn't want to keep living in the darkness, but we didn't know how to get out. And Jesus, through the resurrection, came in and broke that yoke, setting us free. No longer do we offer ourselves as instruments of wickedness, but rather as instruments of righteousness. You know, for me, I, um, I was a very rebellious teenager. I was a very dark teenager. <laughs> I very much was seeking out the darkness and seeking out everything that the darkness was, was putting out as an advertisement. I call it the American Pie Gospel. If you don't know what American Pie is, you don't have to look it up. Please don't look it up. It's a series of movies that are unbelievably ungodly. And that was what I was mesmerized into thinking that's what life is all about. Getting drunk, chasing girls, smoking weed, being a hooligan. And so for me, I thought to myself, you know, that's what I'm going to be going. I'm going to be an instrument for those purposes. And yet, God in his wisdom picked the perfect time to send disciples into my life, to invite me out to a Bible discussion, to invite me out to church, and to sit me down and study the Bible with me, showing me what it means to understand, know, and live by the resurrection of Jesus. You know, for me, I, I, live, I live from a standpoint of, of just being grateful just to be a disciple. And I hope you do, too. Um, you know, my, my father, who, who passed away a couple years ago, he, um, he was very worried about me <laughs> as a young teenager. And he shared this story with me after I became a disciple. I think he was afraid to share it with me when I was still in the darkness because it was insinuating where I was headed. But um, he shares this story with me that as an eight-year-old, we're at the grocery store, and, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I make my way into the alcohol aisle, and I grab a bottle as an eight-year-old, and my dad had, at, uh, up until that point, was about 14 or 15 years sober. Not a single alcohol bottle in the house. I don't even know what alcohol really is, other than going to Mexico and seeing Coronas everywhere. But um, that's neither here nor there. Um, but for me, as an eight-year-old, he says, he describes me as grabbing this bottle and then going up to him and, like, kind of goofing off, like, <laughs> and my dad's face dropped. Now, keep in mind, my dad was a drunkard before he got sober. Um, and so he actually, he died at 72 years old. At the age of 36, he decided to become sober and was 36 years sober on the day of his death. But imagine having, you know, uh, become sober and understanding the, the dangers of alcoholism, your eight-year-old son grabbing a bottle of alcohol. And I was headed towards being a drunkard. That, that's where I was headed. Until Jesus came in and broke that power of sin over my life. And I live every day in just gratitude. Gratitude that Jesus would save a sinner like me. A wretched man like me. And not only that, but then he would give me an amazing, beautiful wife. A wife, a wife who never ages. She looks the same as she did when I first met her, now almost 14 years ago. Not only that, but God would give me not just two kids, but three kids, one being a Canadian. Wow. Who am I? I, mean, who, I already forgot my name. Who am I? Who am I that God would be so gracious to me to give me a family both physically but even spiritually in this room. Well, how can we make sure that we can break this power of sin in our lives? Well, look here in Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. <laughs> we have been set free, family. For those visiting with us, we want to help you get set free as well. We are so excited that we get to live lives where we are set free from the power 
of sin. You know, Jesus coming into our lives has transformed us and changed us forever. There's no going back for us when you become a true disciple. There's no going back. It's similar to when you get in a car accident. You can have like a little fender bender, right, where you know, the car can get repaired and you can still drive it and you know, go about your day, right? But there's other car accidents where the car is what's, what is called totaled. Some of us are maybe familiar with that, right? And so the car is being totaled, meaning that you cannot transform it and repair it back to what it was originally. You with me? And so similarly, when we, when we become true disciples, we become totaled cars in the sense that we cannot go back to the way it was. We now know the truth. We now understand what is expected of us. And there's no going back. For us, we are those who have been forever changed by the power of the resurrection. That is the kind of church that you have come to today. Not an empty house. Not an empty religion. Not an empty set of, of chairs in which you say, peace be with you, and then you go about your day, and then you forget that you even had peace in the first place. That's the way I grew up. <laughs> and yet, with God, through the power of his resurrection, we can truly have a life set free. And you may be wondering to yourself, man, Kirk, this is a lot. Man, I don't know. This is a lot, man. I don't know if I can do this. I, I can't. I, I don't know if I can have the strength to do this. It's too much. You're right. Turn over to Philippians 4. I'm glad that you now recognize you can't do it on your own. I'm so fired up because that is the truth. You cannot do it on your own strength. Many, many try to in many false doctrine churches out there. And yet at the end of the day, what do we realize? They were living double lives, unfaithful to their wives, children hate them, no, no, no ministry to actually be proud of, just simply a, a religious experience that they were able, able to orchestrate. But in this room, that's not what we are. We are those who rely completely and solely on the strength that God gives us. And I'm glad that you now understand you can't do this on your own. Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This is why we need the power of the resurrection, family. Because you cannot do it on your own. You've got to go find Jesus. You know, I wish I could tell you guys that Jesus is right off of Young and Finch. Right, off the, right, right by the Starbucks right there on that little corner. And I would love to be able to tell all of you, guys, if you want to be set free, Young and Finch, 4 o'clock today. I, I, I would be overjoyed to be able to do that for you. But the truth is, Jesus went up, he ascended, and he gave us the instructions. you got to find Jesus in what you have at your fingertips. In the four Gospels, in the New Testament. And you've got to dig into the scriptures and actually know your Bible actually dig in to understand it's only through that that God can strengthen you and give you the power the same power that he exerted in bringing Jesus <clears throat> back from the dead my hope for every one of us today is to not only have the knowledge of the resurrection but to have the power of the resurrection every day the power that will enable us even at our weakest moments to have victory over sin Victory over fear, and even victory on the last day when we get called back home, victory over death. I love you all. Happy Resurrection Sunday, and to God be all the glory.